All right, and it appears we are live, so I will welcome everybody to yet another installation of Looking Up, our uh, virtual stargazing space and astronomy event uh, hosted by the BAA <clears throat> um, and in part thanks to the Buffalo Museum of Science, Penn Dixie Fossil Park and Nature Reserve, and of course, any other uh, guests that we ever have dropping in. Um, I will be your MC today. Hello, my name is Holly Cohen. I am the Astronomy Program Coordinator and uh, Facilitator of Learning at the Buffalo Museum of Science. So uh, we all are here because we love astronomy, we love space, and there's a lot going on up there. Even if it is kind of cruddy weather here in Buffalo, New York, a little bit cold, blustery, snowy, probably not the best for stargazing. But regardless, we are so happy that you are here. We have quite a show for you tonight. We will uh, be welcoming a few of our most uh, dedicated volunteers and guests for our program. First, we're going to start with uh, BAA President Mike Humphrey as he discusses the news surrounding the James Webb Space Telescope. It's getting more exciting by the day. Then we'll move on to Ernie Jacobs as he reviews some stargazing basics just in time for the weather to start to get a little bit less cold, snowy, and blustery. And then onwards, we will be welcoming the wonderful Dennis Barkoviak as he helps us celebrate and get ready for Near Miss Day. And of course, finally, we will welcome Tim Collins with a virtual look at what's in the sky in the coming weeks. So without further ado, I believe we should go ahead and get started. I would like to welcome BAA President, Mr. Mike Humphrey. Mike, take it away. Hello everybody, and it's great to see everybody tonight. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in the sky, but as a quick announcement, there's one thing happening on the ground. That's right, April 2nd, we're gonna have our first public night at the Beaver Meadow Observatory. So. Is no, it's great to see us here live and you get to see us and talk to us, but even better is getting to see us in person. So you can get to come up, see what we're doing, and hopefully you'll see some folks come out and meet us there. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna go over and I am about to share my screen with you here and got a little special presentation. Um, I have really, really enjoying what's going on with the web. And it's just so much fun watching the technology and basically what's up with the web. So let's take a look and see what's up with the web. Where is it? Okay, so we know it was launched. We know it's going to the L2 point. Here's the L2 point. And at this point, just a quick review. This is about 93, 930,000 miles away from the earth. What's happening is at this point and the L2, the force is pushing the web away and the force is pulling it towards the sun equalize. And every 28 days, we'd have to do a minor adjustment, but this orbit is fairly stable. This makes good sense for something like this because we can put it there and we know that we'll be able to get great images because it's in a stable, very stable orbit. I'm gonna switch up here now. This is what I found very interesting. When you look at the web and as you've seen it and it's got the sun shield on the hot side, it's 127 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 feet away on the cool side is minus 389 degrees Fahrenheit. I know this sounds kind of like what Buffalo weather is like, but when you stop and think about it out in space and the technology they did put this to make this thing happen, this is fantastic to think that this much of a temperature gradient is gonna actually exist. So what are we doing now? So we're phased in cool down, instrument calibration, but instrument calibration, and it's 930,000 miles away. So how are we gonna do that? First, we have to select a star. The star we select is HD8, 4406, and I'm going to skip this side and jump right to here so we can see where it is. So Ursa Major, if you want to find it, you can go out, find Ursa Major, side along the top of the bucket, you find the two stars and go straight line, and you see it right where that arrow is pointing and right where the target is. Now, what's great about this star is it's fairly stable, and we know that we can see it. It's at the right magnitude, so it's not going to overwhelm the instruments, but it's too bright for us to use for actual web viewing. So we're not going to be viewing a star. We're just using it for calibration. If you have a telescope, you can go outside and take a look at it and you'll be seeing what the web is looking at now. So what's the next point? There's 18, as you can see in this diagram, 
there's 18 segments, there's 18 mirrors, they all point to a secondary. So we have to align all these 18 segments so we can have one image. This is an image and this is a, I will call it a live image, but this is an image directly from web right now. This is from the near can camera, looking up to show that number one, all the segments have unfolded. Everything is getting ready to go into alignment. One segment is lit up just because of the way the near cam works, but you can see, so this is a, one of our first images from space from the web. Here's what the 18 segments look like. Now, each segment has a beryllium mirror that's covered with gold. Now, when I say covered, it's actually got about a golf ball size amount of gold. So any prospectors out there thinking going up and finding the web and recovering it, probably not worth it. But these 18 segments, the reason we use beryllium is very temperature resistant and gold is highly reflective. This makes sense in a mirror like this. Each segment has an actuator and what the actuator allows to do is to independently align each segment. This is a simulation. Now what NASA did was they said, when we get our first alignment picture, what is it gonna look like? This is what they think it's gonna look like. And this is what it actually looks like. And I'm gonna flip back here. You can see they're fairly consistent. If you wanna count, and I'm not gonna stay here that long, but you could, there's 18 little dots on here. And these represent each of the 18 segments that we're gonna be using for the alignment. Another way to see it, you can see each assignment is now what the segment is, which part of the mirror is showing. And in this case, we're also showing the wing segments too. I'm gonna to throw a little diagram up here in the corner where you can see the actuators and you can see all the segments all aligned with each one with the B5A6. Each one is aligned with one part of the mirror so that we can see when we start to bring everything into alignment, which mirror we're gonna be moving. This is a simulation. Now, this is what NASA thinks it's gonna look like when they actually start to look at it. And the best way to do this and if you've ever used any of our telescopes and you ever tried to find something, one of the things we'll tell you is if you're looking for an image and it's a very small image, defocus just a little bit. It will make the image look a little larger. So it will defocus the scope, make the image look a little larger, get all the segments into alignment like this way, and then we'll slowly bring them into focus. Just like that. Again, this is another simulation, but this gives you an idea of where the segments are and where our the actuator exists. Then it'll be moving across the A group, the B group, and the C group. Once each of these is aligned and you have a single image, then it's ready to start imaging. I'm gonna show a quick animation here. Now this is real. This is what the NASA actually sent as a mosaic to show the actual alignment of the mirror and phasing and calibration. And that's what it looks like now. The next step is to bring each of these 18 dots into one singular dot right in the middle, and then we're ready to get started. And that's gonna be on July 22nd. What we are planning is a program, when that first image comes out, we're gonna have that. We're getting that right from NASA, they will be sending us some information. And we are one of the community groups that will be able to sponsor something to see what this is gonna look like, and hopefully we'll be able to share those images with everyone here. So I just want to bring one site here. First off, all the images that we've used today are courtesy from NASA. So every single one is directly from the NASA site. If you want more information, this is the website to go to. And what this does is it shows you where the web is right now. Some of the Im images and the animations I've used today, you can find on this site and it's just a wealth of information or you can send to us at our site, which is info at buffaloastronomy.com and hopefully somebody there will pick up and be able to answer your question. Thanks everybody for listening. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw this right, okay, because they opened up for questions, I'm gonna throw it right back to Holly, so. Holly, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, that's wonderful news. It sounds like everything is going off uh, smoothly with the James Webb Space Telescope. We have a lot to look forward to in the coming months. So uh, just a reminder, we will also be monitoring the live chats on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, so if you have a question for any of us, feel free to drop it in the chat and we will get to it um, anytime during this program today. So uh, I want to do a quick shout out. I'm gonna give a shout out to Don, one of our viewers. Hello, Don, thank you for uh, joining in with us. As we move right on along to 
the BAA's own Ernie Jacobs giving us a few pointers for stargazing. Ernie. Muted. Sorry about that, I was muted. Forgot to unmute myself. Can you hear me now? Okay, well, let's get, uh, get the presentation going. Hopefully you're seeing my presentation. Um, hold on a second. Something is going wrong. I'm going to stop my share. Okay, I got it. Sorry about that. Okay, basic stargazing skills. Sorry about the too many windows open. Too, too many things going on. So uh, who is the target audience for this presentation? So maybe you've asked one of these questions. I know for a fact, doing lots of astronomy outreach, these are questions that we hear a lot, sometimes in the comments um, on some of these presentations and some of our outreach events. But I've always been interested in astronomy, but my kids are showing an interest in astronomy, but we have a telescope, but where to start? This is the target audience for this presentation. Um, perhaps you've got recently got a telescope, you know, you or someone in your family has an interest, um, but you have, don't really have any idea where to begin, where to start. Um, if you're a little bit more experienced, hang in there. You may pick up a nugget. I know I always do during some of these presentations, there's always something uh, that somebody points out that I didn't know before. And you might get um, some help or an idea um, that might help you mentor somebody else. And pretty much for everything that I'm gonna discuss here, there's no telescope required. Um, this, this will work with just your eyes. It will work through binoculars, through telescope. Um, it, it doesn't matter, but it's really focused at people that don't even have any kind of optical, optical aid yet. So skill zero, patience. This hobby is a learned skill. It's just like playing a musical instrument or playing a sport. So give yourself a break. No one is born knowing how to do all this stuff. Um, we all struggled learning how to figure this stuff out. Um, and we certainly got a lot of help for, uh, from others. So don't be uh, shy about asking for help, coming to our events, and trying to figure out how to, how, to, uh, how to do this. So let's get to the real skills. Skill number one, practice the stars. So practice finding the star, the brighter stars in the sky. This is really a foundational skill. Um, you'll begin to learn how to orient yourself in the sky. You'll learn how the night sky moves, and I put that in quotes because it's a parent motion, from night to night and season to season. Um, this opens the door to finding the constellation, and it's basically a basic building block to finding objects with optical aid. If you have a pair of binoculars or telescope and you're new to the hobby, make this your warm-up. Think of it like a musician practicing scales. Maybe we'll call them star scales. Again, no telescope required. So practice the stars, which one? Well, the list will depend on your location on earth. For this presentation, we're gonna focus on what's up for mid Northern latitudes. Here in Buffalo, New York, um, you know, we're on the East coast of the United States. Um, that's the, those are the stars, the sky that we'll be, we'll be coming it on. If we have any viewers in the Southern hemisphere, uh, this will probably be a little bit different for you. Um, this, it also depend on the season. It'll also depend on the time, horizon, 
sky condition and, and the sky conditions. Most of the stars that we're going to provide should punch through most light pollution and shouldn't be a problem. But uh, clearly, if you've got lots of tall buildings, bright lights pointing into wherever you're looking from, or tall trees, um, you know that's going to those kind of things are going to have an impact on what you can find. Um, and we're going to try to keep the list, you know, around 10, six to 10 stars. So here's a good list for March 2022. Um, we're going to start with Polaris, the North Star. And then we've got Bright Star Capella, Aldebaran, Betelgeuse, Rigel, Sirius, Castor and Pollux, Regulus, Denebula, Denebula, and Arcturus. So you don't need to practice every one of these every time you go out. Pick five or six or eight or whatever. Um, you know, maybe if you're just walking to your car, once you get to your car and you stop walking, because we don't want anybody to fall or trip, that could be painful. Um, but once you um, look up, maybe you can find a couple of quick stars if it's clear out. So now we have a list. So now we need to work on how are we going to find them or how are we going to identify which ones are which, right? So first of all, the stars that are listed are bright. They, sh they should be some of the first stars that are visible and they should stand out from the fainter stars and hopefully punch through light pollution for those of, that, those, those of you that might live like within city limits. And we're going to also provide uh, some recommendations on some useful tools. Um, there's smartphone and tablet apps. Um, they're, every, they're ubiquitous. I have several on my phone uh, and they're great to use. Um, there's all sky maps um, and planispheres. For this discussion, we're really gonna focus on all sky maps. I think they make a really good tool uh, for the beginner. So we're gonna talk about all sky maps. First of all, um, when you're actually taking one out to use it, one of the things we recommend is having a red light instead of a regular flashlight with white light. That will, al that will allow you to not ruin your night vision. Um, and most of the big box retailers, they sell headlamps that have both white and red lights. Um, you can even get some like red cellophane or something like that and put it over a flashlight to make one yourself. Um, so there's lots of all sky maps out. Um, here's, a lit, uh, here's a few places that you can find them. Um, the evening sky map, uh, you can download a map that's good for the entire month. Heavens Above, um, they have a website and they have an interactive sky chart. So you can, when you log in, you can put in your viewing location and then you can put in your, the time and date and you can get a customized sky chart for your sky. Um, sky and Telescope on their website has an interactive sky, ch sky chart and it's actually powered by the Heavens Above uh, interactive sky chart. And both Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine have printed versions of these maps in the center fold section of their magazine. Um, so you can buy the magazine and, and rip out the, the sky chart. So my preference, especially for outreach, is the evening sky uh, map. Uh, this has a lot of useful information on it um, beyond the map itself. Um, it has a calendar of events. And I'm actually going to go to the next page. It has a, it's actually a two page, so you can, you can print it off if you have the capability of uh, printing two sided. It also has lists of celestial objects, um, things that are naked eye visible, things that are easily seen with binoculars, telescopes, glossary, and so on. So it is, in my opinion, an extremely useful document. So understanding and using the All Sky map. So when we look at the map, and I'm actually going to go back to this slide here. When we look at the map, the stars, which are represented as dots, the stars with bigger dots 
are the ones that are more bright or have a low, as we say, have a lower magnitude, which would indicate that they're brighter. Um, the center of the map is directly overhead or what we call zenith. The circumference of the map represents the horizon. So to use one of these, okay, you're gonna hold it in front of you and you can rotate the map just like a steering wheel and whatever direction you're looking, north, south, east, northwest, whatever, you wanna have that direction be down. And then all of, for instance, in this case, in, in this picture, it looks like south is down. So this would be the horizon in front of you. And these would be all the stars you would see up in front of you, uh, up, up to zenith. And if you turn around rotate, you know, to, and face east, turn and rotate the map to the east. Pretty simple to use. So skill number three, celestial signposts or landmarks. Use bright asterisms or constellations just like you would use signposts or landmarks when trying to find your way on the ground. Think about it. If somebody asked you for directions to whatever tops, you might say, you know, make a left at the post office, turn right at the blah, blah, blah gas station, and it'll be the second thing, second left on your, uh, you know, the second driveway on your left. Um, we use const the brighter constellations and, um, and some asterisms, which are groupings of stars that are not official constellations to help us orient ourselves and, and, and find other things in the sky. So some examples of those are the Big Dipper, um, Cassiopeia, uh, the Kite in Bootes, Orion, the Great Square of Pegasus, the Sickle or the Backwards question mark in Leo, the Summer Triangle, the Winter Triangle, and the Winter hex Hexagon. Um, so my next slide, you can see an example. This is showing the asterism of the Big Dipper. And you can use this asterism to first of all, know that you, you're generally facing north. And if you can identify these two pointer stars, well, they point directly to Polaris, the North Star, which is the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, which is another asterism. So that's an example, you know, and you can you look for these bright constellations. Cassiopeia is a very bright constellation. Orion is dominating the sky in the Southwest right now. And they can very much help you find um, where you are and where you're looking. And they're just very easy, re easily recognizable. So skill number four is uh, being able to measure angular distance. Um, and that's how we tell how far away things are in the sky. So if you hold your hand out directly in front of you, arm fully extended, um, you can measure various distances and. I have a little uh, graphic that'll show that in the next slide um, that you can measure various distances that different celestial objects, you know, might be located from one another. And basically this is a one size fits all deal. This works for almost everyone. Um, if you have a bigger fist, you most likely have a longer arm and it, the, everything all works out. Um, so here's, our little pictogram. And as you can see, um, now, interestingly enough, your pinky finger is one degree. So you could stick up your pinky finger and cover the moon or the sun, but we don't recommend looking directly at the sun um, because they're only a half degree in size on the sky. So your little pinky finger can, can cover up the moon. Um, the, you know, the most common one that's and why, you know one of the more widely used one is a fist, which so from the the top of the fist to the bottom of the fist is uh, subtends so ten degrees, um, and of course it goes all the way out to twenty five degrees. So you know you can use your own body to get some pretty rough, pretty useful measurements on the sky. So what's next? So after you started to gain some proficiency. Um, you know, some of the things 
that you can start, you know, looking at doing um, is now starting to associate those stars with the constellations that they're in, start actually learning the constellations. And there's actually um, a program in the Astronomical League, it's an observing program called the Constellation Hunter. And it's actually a very useful program for beginners. Um, if you are a BAA member, one of the perks of our membership is reduced membership to the Astronomical League. So you could, you could do this program and submit your, your data um, and get a pin. But even if you're not, and you just wanna do it to help you learn, it's a great exercise. The material's on the web, you can download it and you can, and you can do it yourself. And if you fill out the sketch sheets and fill out all the data, hang on to it. Because if you ever do join, you'd still be eligible to get your pin. Um, other things to start as a beginner is, is, is looking at the moon, observing the phases, you know, the, its motion across the sky from night to night, and some of the larger features that can be seen with the naked eye. Um, some of the mar maria or seas and the um, large craters. So to wrap this up, you know, this just scratches the surface. Um, but be patient. This is a learned skill. Practice stars whenever you can. I hope this help, you find this helpful. And now go outside and look up. I hope, wish everyone clear skies. So with that, thank you. And I will end my presentation and I will stop my screen share. I don't know, were there any questions? Thank you, Ernie. Let's look into our YouTube and Facebook chats and look for some questions. We're getting wonderful comments from our visitors and our viewers. Uh, thank you to Tom on YouTube. Thank you to Aaron and Joe for joining us. I don't see any questions just yet. So I will go ahead and thank you very much for sharing all of this, Ernie. All right, um, sounds good. I, I am quite uh, new to astronomy. Some people have been uh, kind of practicing this stuff all of their lives. I've been at it for about five or six years. So learning these tips and kind of starting from the basics can be very useful. Even if you think you already know how to un unlock the sky a little bit, and even if you know what you're looking at the second that you look up. I'm kind of here in my space corner uh, in my house right now. And of course, right behind me was one of our stargazing tools. So of course, I'm trying to not have my uh, reflection going on right here, but this is kind of a large version of a planisphere similar to the sky map that Ernie featured. It's kind of got a clear plastic over here and the map of the stars all behind it. And similar to how Ernie said, the way to use these things, you want to put the direction that you are facing, the cardinal direction you're facing at the bottom. So. If I wanted to look south, I would want to hold this thing what looks like upside down. And this is going to be the type of sky that you see at the date and time that you set it for. Um, of course, every once in a while here in the Northern Hemisphere, you do have to add or subtract an hour for daylight savings time. Luckily, the uh, clocks are springing forward this weekend. So you won't have to worry about that anytime soon. And if you want something like a planisphere, you could always pr print them off. We have some wonderful resources for that, as Ernie just showed. Or you can get something like the one I was holding up at any museum gift shop. I see them at bookstores, um, and uh, they're, they're very useful tools. Mine happens to be glow in the dark, but unfortunately, the light that comes off of it isn't red. So it could just get a little bit more ideal. All right, so we are going to roll right along as we uh, continue our looking up presentation. So we are going to welcome. Uh, from the BAA, Dennis Bartkoviak, as he uh, kind of gets us ready for an interesting date that I actually did not know existed until uh, talking with him. But before that, we are going to actually uh, go over to Dennis for a quick message regarding uh, how you can support events and uh, the passions like these that you're seeing tonight. So go ahead, Dennis. Why, thank you very much, Holly. Uh, I really appreciate it and welcome everyone to our Looking Up event. And certainly I have a little presentation for you and hopefully I can make it come off because I'm not used to doing all of these presentations and, uh, and the like. But 
I want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone out there for supporting us by coming and seeing us uh, live on on Facebook and on YouTube. But I also have to reach out you reach out to you and ask you for some assistance. Um, so we are looking at returning to our live events, as Mike said, coming up in April. And most certainly, uh, we can use your support by coming out, but also by donations. Yes, you heard me right. You hear me asking for donations. Uh, any donation can help us um, and help us spread the spread the news. We, we're looking to do some virtual star parties and do these presentations. We're looking for new up, uh, new equipment upgrades and um, some of observatory upgrades. So any little bit that you can provide helps. Now you can do that online here. You can connect with the BAA website uh, and do a donation. You can also join us as a member. So now as I sit here and talk and you're looking up at our virtual star party donate button, I am going to make the attempt to go ahead and start my uh, presentation. So. Let's see if this works for me or not. And you'll have to give me a moment because I'm not quite used to, to using this PowerPoint stuff. So give me one second. And that's not what I wanted to do. And I have to go to the top of the presentation to start it, I believe. And Oh my goodness. So you're gonna to have to give me a moment as I'm talking and trying to do this. I lost my uh, screen on top of this and it says new slide, but it's not letting me do it. <laughs> I love it. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, as we are doing this live and why is it not doing the presentation for me? Slideshow, here we go from the beginning and I have to do something called switching my slideshow. Whoop, I ended my slideshow by mistake. And we will have to do, let's see here, display my settings as I was told to do and swap my settings here. And I have to look up because I have way too many, way too many monitors here in front of me. So let's see if I can do this appropriately now and see if you have everything up and I will do my screen PowerPoint presentation and sharing. And so I'm gonna to need to get a thumbs up possibly from Holly if she actually sees that. Yes, most definitely. And so um, this is near mistake, the meteorite that wasn't. On March 22nd, 1989, an asteroid, oops, it looks, and yeah, excuse me. On March 22, 1989, an asteroid, unobserved and unknown to us, flew by Earth at a very close and hazardous distance of less than 500,000 miles. This was not known until nine days later when American astronomers Henry E. Holt and Norman G. Thomas discovered the asteroid, 4581 Asclepius, named in reference to the son of Apollo and the Roman god of medicine and healing. Many scientists believe that the collision of Asclepius with the Earth would have been disastrous, resulting in an almost unimaginable release of energy. The slide that you're seeing now is the actual size of the Asclepius as it would hit over Beaver Meadow. Yes, that's where the BAA has. That's just the size of the meteorite, or excuse me, the asteroid, um, as it would have landed on our planet. Thankfully, it was a near miss. According to scientists and astronomers, many meteoroids and asteroids have passed by the Earth since 1989. However, the odds of an asteroid hitting the Earth were not high. Whew. That's a relief. Since that day, there have been many changes. Missions were organized and technology has improved with observations and detections accelerating the surveying of near Earth objects and mathematical predictions of future potential impacts have evolved. To facilitate communication among astronomers, the Palermo Technical Impact Hazard Scale is used. And to improve public communication, the Torino Impact Hazard Scale is used. Now, a little bit from our friends at NASA. How do we spot near-Earth asteroids? To start, survey telescopes scan the sky. 
When multiple pictures of the same spot show a speck that's moving, computers automatically check it against a database of known objects. If there's no match, it gets added to a list of objects to confirm. And if it looks like it'll pass very close to us, we give it top priority. Then it's time to call in reinforcements. More astronomers from NASA, other institutions, and even the amateur community submit additional observations. Each new data point helps refine the projected path, and this asteroid is going to fly right on by. All the info will be posted online so it can continue to be tracked and monitored. Nice work, Planetary Defense Team. Keep watching the skies. I've got to love the folks over at NASA and the Planetary Defense Team. Certainly very, very cool. Okay, near Miss Day, uh, March 23rd, is an annual reminder that the Earth nearly escaped this devastating collision with an asteroid. This occasion brings us together to be thankful it was a near miss and to celebrate that we all got another chance. This near miss event changed perspectives on cosmic influences. It made one realize the limits of humankind and that we have a lack of control over the universe. It reminds us that asteroids and meteors could lead to the extin extinction of the Earth and humanity. Yet it promotes discussion, science observation, and theories of space and our place in the universe. Carl Sagan said, I believe our future depends on how well we know this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. So again, another presentation from the folks over at NASA for you. In 2135, a potentially hazardous asteroid called Bennu will make a close flyby of Earth. During this encounter, our planet's gravity will tweak Bennu's path, making it a challenge to calculate its future trajectory and the odds of a potential impact late in the 22nd century. Why is this hard to determine? Well, we know how gravity works, but there are still uncertainties in Bennu's trajectory that will be magnified by the close encounter. In addition to gravity, asteroids can be pushed around by non-gravitational forces, like the Yarkovsky effect. When sunlight strikes a rotating asteroid, the day side heats up. As the asteroid turns, the night side cools down and releases the heat. This exerts a small thrust on the asteroid, which can change its direction over time. The Yarkovsky effect is challenging to model, but it can make a big difference in determining where asteroids end up. Because we don't know exactly how the Yarkovsky effect will perturb Bennu's orbit, we have limited knowledge of where Bennu will be as it approaches Earth in 2135. Scientists thus have to consider a range of possible trajectories, depending on how strongly the Yarkovsky effect is pushing on Bennu. A few of these trajectories line up with regions of space called gravitational keyholes. If Bennu were to pass through a keyhole, Earth's gravity would bend its path in just the right way to cause an impact on a subsequent orbit late in the 22nd century. The odds of this actually happening are quite low, but scientists want to know as much as possible. That's one reason why NASA sent the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft to study Bennu from 2018 to 2021. OSIRIS-REx greatly improved our knowledge of Bennu's position, density, thermal inertia, and other properties that can influence how its orbit will evolve over time. The new data allowed scientists to significantly reduce uncertainties in Bennu's predicted orbit, ruling out a number of keyholes for the 2135 flyby and eliminating several future impact scenarios. While Bennu remains a hazardous asteroid, we can now make better models of its orbital evolution thanks to OSIRIS-REx. This will allow us, and our descendants, to better calculate Bennu's risk in the decades and centuries to come. Gotta love science. Gotta love the uh, folks over at NASA. Now, pop culture can create some confusion. Things like large doses of radiation and gamma ray bursts do not give you superpowers. They just kill you. While you survived uh, the early February 2022 coronal mass ejection or solar storm, where the sun projected a lot of energy and charged particles, uh, 40 SpaceX Starlink satellites did not. And so as a result, uh, they fell and burned up, as you can see in this video footage from Puerto Rico on February 7th, 
captured by the astronomy group, and you'll have to forgive me on the prison, uh, pronunciation, Sociedad de Astronomy del Caribe, uh, which shows Starlink satellites disintegrating. And so here you can actually see some of those starlight satellites disintegrating. The next shot that you'll see in this video um, is a, a little bit better and some maybe be some of the ones that you've seen before on the internet and presented uh, when the Starlink satellites were affected by our sun. That's some pretty impressive stuff re-entering the atmosphere right there and a pretty impressive sight. I'm going to go ahead and stop that one here and see if we go up to the near miss day timeline. Now I had a little difficulty with my presentation. She'll ha you'll have to just be listening to me on this timeline. But on March 22nd, 1989, 4581 Asclepius uh, passes close by Earth at a distance of almost 500,000 miles. On March 31st, 1989, the American astronomers Henry Holt and Norman Thomas discovered that Asclepius had passed by the Earth. On the cosmic scale of things, that was a close call, said Dr. Holt. On August 1989, scientists find another asteroid that comes very close to hitting the Earth again, although the chances were very slim. And then a year after the discovery of Asclepius, in 1990, scientists confirmed its diameter to be about 300 meters. Subsequent discoveries reveal that a whole class of such potentially hazardous asteroids exist, and that the object the size of Asclepius probably comes by undetected once every two or three years. So now we have a few facts for you. When can Asclepius hit the Earth again? Well, its orbital period is the time that it takes to complete an orbit of the sun. It's 1.03 years. Asclepius will continue to make close approaches to Earth coming within 0.21 astronomical units, or 12 times in the 21st century. Now, you might ask what an astronomical unit is. The astronomical unit is a unit of length defined rough, as roughly the distance from the Earth to the sun and equal to about 150 million kilometers, or 93 million miles, or approximately eight light minutes. The actual distance from the Earth to the sun varies by about 3% as the Earth orbits the sun from a maximum dif dip distance, or aphelion, to a minimum distance, or perihelion, and back again once every year. The astronomical unit was originally conceived as the average of Earth's aphelion and perihelion. Since 2012, however, it has been defined as exactly 149,597,870.7 kilometers. That's a big mouthful. Because of the problems with the variables, the new fixed definition does not vary. And with the, with the meter defined as the distance traveled by light in a vacuum in, of one in 299,792,458 of a second, leading to more precise measurements. Now, a close approach will occur on March 24th, 2051, when it will get within 0 0.0122 astronomical units. But the next pass comparable to the 1989 one will not take place until the year 2189. Yes, you heard me right, 2189. So when they go back and look at this looking up event, um, they will see that we mentioned that Asclepius will be coming close within 980,000 kilometers give or take a few. Uh, the difference between asteroids and meteorites, uh, these amazing rocks from space cause wonder and sometimes fear among us. Knowing a bit more about them and how they differ may remove some of that fear. They are given different names depending on their location. For example, uh, for example, they are traveling through space. Are they traveling through space, hurtling through our atmosphere, or have they impacted Earth's surface? An asteroid is a large rocky body in space in orbit around the sun. A meteoroid is a, is a small smaller rock. Had my notes on it, and uh, I apologize again. And so let me go back to... Uh, Uh, 
uh, or an asteroid is called when it enters the Earth's atmosphere and vaporizes or burns up. It is often referred to as a shooting star. A meteorite is a small asteroid or meteoroid that survives its journey through space, Earth's atmosphere, and lands on Earth's surface. And another, re another related term you may hear is bolide. That is a very bright meteor that explodes in the atmosphere. This can also be called a fireball. Asteroids, like Bennu here, are, are mainly found in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Sometimes their orbits, and that's the slide that you were looking at for the longest time, <laughs> uh, sometimes their orbits are altered and come up uh, closer to the Sun and Earth. In addition, there have been discussions among astronomers about the potential existence of large number of asteroids in the Kuiper, and Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud. So this image that you're looking at on screen now is the is the 12 image mosaic of the asteroid Bennu composed of polycam images collected on December 2nd by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft from a range of about 15 miles. And the credit goes to the NASA Goddard folks and the University of Arizona. Asteroids are sometimes referred to as minor planets or planetoids, but in general, they are rocky bodies that do not have an atmosphere. Some have their own orbiting bodies or moons. Our solar system contains millions of asteroids, many of which are thought to be shattered remains of the young sun's solar nebula that never formed planets. The size of what an asteroid is, is not extremely well defined. It can range from a few meters wide, like a boulder, to a hundred, hundreds of kilometers in diameter. The largest asteroid is Ceres. You're looking at an image of that now, at about 952 kilometer kilometers in diameter and Ceres is so large that it is also categorized as a dwarf planet. The image that you see of Ceres here is from NASA's Dawn spacecraft um, that has helped us learn much about Ceres. It's from NASA and the JPL and Caltech, UCLA, etc. Most asteroids are made of rock as we have learned more about them. We know that some are composed of metal like nickel and iron. According to NASA, a small portion of the asteroid population may be burned out comets whose ices have evaporated away and been blown off into space. How often do asteroids hit Earth? Now, the image that you're looking at now um, is Meteor Crater in Arizona. And this was taken by our own Ernie Jacobs when he went to visit. While we do know some asteroids pass very close to the Earth's orbit around the sun, we've been lucky in our history that we haven't had a large asteroid hit Earth in the past several thousand years. Now, satellite imagery helps us see evidence of past asteroid impacts. One of the more famous impact craters in Earth is the meteor crater in Arizona, which you're looking at. Um, and the, another notable impact is off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, or the Chicxulub impact crater, and is believed to be a record of event that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Show, oh, and I'm reading my thing that says, go ahead and show the slide. Again, this is from the NASA JPL folks, uh, taken on 3-6-2003, and it is the shuttle uh, radar topography mission on the top and the Landsat satellite on the bottom. Now, this is an image that I've taken uh, out at Beaver Meadow during the Perseid meteor shower. NASA estimates that about once a year, an automobile-sized ast asteroid enters Earth's atmosphere, creates an impressive fireball, and disintegrates before reaching the surface. Many are not detected because they explode high in the atmosphere or because most of the Earth's surface is water, a large percentage of, uh, excuse me, Many are not detected because they explode high in the atmosphere or because most of the Earth's surface is water and a large percentage of land is un uninhabited. Studies of Earth's history indicate that about once every 5,000 years or so, an average, uh, through, boy, excuse me, 5,000 years or so on average, an object the size of a football field hits Earth and causes significant damage. Once every few million years, an average, on average, an object large enough to cause a regional or global disaster impacts Earth. Now, meteors, meteoroids, and boloids, space debris smaller than an asteroid, are called meteoroids. A meteoroid is a piece of interplanetary matter that is smaller than an asteroid and frequently are only 
millimeters in size. Most meteoroids that enter the Earth's atmosphere are so small, they vaporize completely and never reach the planet's surface. When they burn up during their descent, they create a beautiful trail known as a meteor, sometimes called a shooting star. Mostly these are harmless, but larger meteoroids that explode in the atmosphere can sometimes be called bolides. They can create shockwaves, which cause problems. Now, meteorite enthusiasts will forever remember the astonishing and massive fireball explosions over the city of Ch Chelyabinsk, February 15th, 2013, that shattered windows with its air blast. It was easily the largest uh, documented meteoric event since the Shkotia Lean Fall of 1947. Now, that was a compilation of images collected off the internet from multiple sources about that, but it was documented in such detail by all the dash cams that we continue to learn all sorts of new stuff. Scientists now estimate that the mass of the original 19 meter wide object was between 12,000 and 13,000 metric tons, twice as large as the first estimates. It entered the Earth's atmosphere traveling at about 19 kilometers per second, 50 times the speed of sound and began to break up at an altitude between 45 and 30 uh, kilometers. One study published in the Journal of Nature calculated the energy of the Chelyabinsk airburst as being equivalent to 400 to 600 kilotons of TNT. Now, no one previously thought a meteor of this size could cause this level of impact with more than 7,000 buildings over six cities being damaged. Additional analysis also suggests that the impacts of this scale happen as often as every few decades instead of once every 150 years, as previously thought. Most impacts occur over the ocean or in remote areas. Fortunately, the majority of the Chelyabinsk asteroid disintegrated while passing through our atmosphere, almost all of it turning to gas, gas and dust. By the time it reached about 27 kilometers, the atmosphere absorbed most of the kinetic energy from the airburst. Boy, was that lucky. Scientists believe that about 5,900 kilograms of meteorites ended up striking the Earth, nearly all in tiny pieces scattered along the bolides route. Many of these pieces show impact melt features and a dark gray-black interior. The largest impact was a 650-kilogram meteorite that crashed through the ice into Lake Chabarkul. Pardon my pronunciation. A team of researchers recovered this piece and found that like 95% of all meteorites, it was a chondrite, a mix of minerals and metals that may be as much as 4.5 billion years old. Chondrites have changed very little from the asteroid they originally came from and can be identified because they've never been exposed to heat strong enough to melt the rock. Now, it is important to note that this spectacular impact was not predicted and it was not related to the asteroid 2012DA14 that was publicized to make a close flyby on the same day. Now, how often is hit, Earth hit by meteorites? Estimates vary on how much cosmic dust and meteorites enter the Earth's atmosphere each day, but it ranges from five to 300 metric tons. Some satellite data suggests that one to 300 metric tons of cosmic dust enter our atmosphere each day and other me measurements, which include radar observations, laser observations, and high altitude aircraft indicate that it could be as low as five metric tons per day. Meteorite. And any part of a meteorite or, or, or an asteroid that survives a fall uh, through the atmosphere and lands on Earth is called a meteorite. Most meteorites are very small. However, their size can range from a fraction of a gram to 100 kilograms or more. Meteorites smaller than two millimeters are classified as micrometeorites. Meteorites have traditionally been divided into three broad categories based on their composition. Stony meteorites are rocks composed mainly of silicate minerals. Stony iron meteorites that are that that are about the same, uh, that contain about the same amounts of both metal and rocky silicates and iron meteorites, which are almost completely made of metal. According to the Planetary Science Institute, 
It is estimated that probably 500 meteorites reach the surface of the Earth each year, but less than 10 are recovered. This is because most fall into the water or land in remote areas that are not accessible or just not seen falling. Meteorites have also been found on the moon and Mars. Scientists have also traced the origin of meteorites found here on Earth to the moon, Mars, moon and Mars. Meteorites are a source of a source of great deal of the knowledge that we have about the composition of other celestial bodies and the formation of our solar system. Uh, let's see here if I have, oh, let's we go to the next one. So I can't see my slides here uh, and my notes and I wasn't able to present them. So I apologize for my errors here. So this is the Shakoti Aline meteorite. Um, you'll, that I mentioned before, an image of it. And this is an image of a meteorite that I have that I will mention. And I'm going to flip back here for you just as I go through this, this next slide. Um, and hopefully Gene can be showing my image, I suppose, while I'm doing this, I will ask him to do that. Um, so let me get down to where I'm at about the meteorites. And here we go. Collecting meteorites and the stories behind the falls, the geology and chemistry can be researched and is very interesting. There is the Center for Meteorite Studies at the Arizona State University, and that has one of the largest university-based meteorite collections. Um, they even post about a meteorite of the month. This month is a Gao Giuini. Uh, it happens to be part of my hobby and is is and part of my hobby is collecting meteorites and I have a collection of one of those meteorites. So this is that meteorite and I am going to go ahead and stop my share for you. Okay. And I am going to reach down and actually show you this meteorite live on screen. Now, many of the times you saw me disappear there and saw the Buffalo Astronomical Association. I apologize. I'm going to put on gloves. Why do I put on gloves? Well, this is a pretty important meteorite. It's a pretty big one. It's a very cool meteorite. And I have oils and water in my hands and I don't want to cause it any problems. So in my package here, and I meant to take some additional pictures of this and put it together, but again, had a little, little technical issue, so I apologize for that. But this, you can see this is a live event. This is that meteorite. This is a very impressive example. This was a witnessed fall. So, this particular meteorite is, am I gonna go over to a, another set of notes that I have as a lot of stuff falls on the ground for me. Um, so I have a, a, a few, uh, few additional notes. So it's a stone with pure heft. It's a witness fall oriented an individual with rollover lip and remnant fusing crust. They have dainty regomoliths, which are those thumb-like impressions that you see. So right here, this looks like a little impression of a thumb-like impression. That's a regomolith. Adorn one face while the other is perfectly smooth. It's quite a beauty. Now, when you put the telescope away or turn off the computer, there is nothing physical to hold on to. Meteorites are real things that we can hold. They tell stories of how our solar system formed. To hold something that's been around for 4 billion or so years helps put things into perspective. It is one thing to learn about astronomy, but when you physically hold on to something that you have seen or learned about, it just solidifies understanding and is more satisfying for me. Now, what group of asteroids does Asclepius belong to? Asclepius is a member, a member of the Apollo group of asteroids. They are a group of asteroids that cross the path of Earth as it orbits the sun. The group name comes from the first asteroid identified in the group, Apollo. The small asteroid that crashed into Chelyabinsk in 2013 is a member of this group. Oh, 
No, I have a piece of that one too. Thank goodness that Asclepius did not become a meteorite. And make sure you keep looking up. And so I'm going to go ahead and after all of my technical issues, say thank you for listening to me. And I'm going to pass you back to Holly Cohen. Holly. Thank you so much for showing us, Dennis. I, I really love uh, watching you light up as you uh, demonstrate and, and kind of share your collection with us. Um, and one of the perks to being a BAA member and taking part in our public nights and uh, getting to know all these wonderful people who are helping put together our event today is that every once in a while you get little gifts. So as Dennis was saying, space can be very far away, it can be very unattainable, but it really means something to be able to hold a piece of it in your hands. He was nice enough to gift me this meteorite. And this is a uh, stone meteorite. It's about two and a half grams, maybe a little bit less. Um, it's kind of in plastic here, kind of suspended in my case. So excuse the glare. And uh, as Dennis was saying, a lot of times you get meteorites that are found in very remote places. Now this was found in Northwest Africa. And if anybody has a globe near them and they want to look towards Northwest Africa, it's going to put you pretty much in the middle of the Sahara Desert. So luckily this did not fall on anybody. It was probably not witnessed, but it was discovered maybe by uh, people crossing the desert, possibly nomads. Um, so it's really special to be able to hold a little piece of space um, and it's also, uh, it puts a lot of things in perspective to know that this may be the oldest thing I will ever see or touch about as old as the solar system, give or take. Um, that's always something we like to share here at the museum. I always like to say, I like space, I like rocks, and I like space rocks because I have a geology background. So it's very exciting to see all those things. All right, so, um, while we have everybody here, we actually did get a really great question in the chat on Facebook from our viewer, Katrina. Now, this was already answered in the chat, but I know that we are on YouTube as well. So I'm going to direct this question to Dennis, um, who has helped me a lot regarding membership for the Buffalo Astronomical Association. So Katrina really loved uh, seeing Ernie's presentation and getting a little bit of a reference to sky viewing and stargazing tools. And she said, I love that tool to find stars in the night sky. My question is, how are members notified when their membership ends? And how do we keep track of the status of our membership? So Dennis, would you be able to answer that for us? Well, absolutely, Holly. Thank you so much for passing that off to me. And I will do my best to answer that question for Katrina. Um, but what this, the Buffalo Astronomical Association, I'm the vice president, but I'm also the membership chair. And I, again, thank you for your support. Now, your membership runs in a calendar year. So it goes from when you joined to when you end. And we have an automatic system that actually notifies you 90 days from your current expiration. Uh, date. Uh, and then it goes uh, 60 days from your current expiration date. And then it does 30 days from your current expiration date. And then it does it when your when your membership has expired. So you actually get notified via email. You can also log in as a member and write on your membership on the website. When you log in as a member, you can actually see where your membership stands uh, looking at our website directly. If you'd like to renew early of your membership, you certainly can do so. And we actually add that time so you don't lose anything uh, if you re renew your membership early. It's very simple to do. It's done online. And if you have any questions at any point in time, you can always contact me directly. Take a look at our website and all of my information is there. I'm not going to say my phone number over YouTube and uh, Facebook, uh, but it is on their website there for you. Uh, and I do not always, I'm not always able to answer the phone immediately, uh, so, but I can return a call. So leave a message. If you don't get hold of me, you can also text me and you can also email me membership at buffaloastronomy.com. That's membership at buffaloastronomy.com. Very simple to do. And so back to you, Holly. Thank you very much, Dennis, for uh, clarifying that. Of course, now that's going to make me go and look at my own calendar, check up on my own status. I think I've got a few months left before I renew. But now that I know that I might be able to renew my uh, membership early, I might just bite the bullet so I don't have to worry about a new date. So thank you for that. All right. So 
For the final uh, formal presentation of our night, I'm going to pass us on over to Tim Collins to give us a little bit of a virtual look of what to look for in the night sky in the coming weeks. Take it away, Tim. Tim, you are muted. You can't hear me through a mute. See, I did I did what Ernie did. I forgot to unmute. Well, good evening. Thank you, Holly. Uh, good to have everybody here tonight. So we're going to take a quick look at what's up in the night sky. And we're going to take a two-month tour here, and there is a reason for that. But I'm going to begin by sharing a quick calendar of what is coming up here. So let me do that really quick, and you will see that coming up here in a moment. I'll give that a second to catch up to us and uh, just some things to be aware of. Now, tonight, as Holly noted, set your clocks ahead one hour. That would be at 2 a.m. is the proper time to do that to bring us to daylight savings. Uh, sunset tomorrow, believe it or not, 719. Doesn't that sound good? Seven for sunset. We've been in the dark so long. Uh, so some other things coming up. The vernal equinox is coming up on March 20th at 1133 a.m. So you can look forward to the first day of spring at that point. Also on March 20th, Venus is at GU. What is GU? GU stands for greatest, East, greatest Elongation Westward. It is the best viewing in the early morning for Venus. So if you get up early before the sun, you will see it very brightly shining in the east southeast so something to look forward to and it would be there uh, for the remainder of the month and into april too but it'll start to head back toward the direction of the sun as it orbits so you have a limited time before to uh, still see it early in the morning april 8th is what we're considering the eclipse countdown milestone now many of us here are also part of the buffalo eclipse consortium and if you're in Buffalo, if you're in Cleveland, if you're in Rochester, if you're in Niagara Falls, somewhere along the path, in 2024, on April 8th, there will be a total eclipse of the sun. Now, it's all, of course, weather dependent, but that is the two-year marker. So uh, that's usually the time where things really start to ramp up uh, as far as advertising. So I think after this April 8th, you are going to hear quite a bit about this solar eclipse coming up from the southern United States heading up toward the north. And as dates go by, we will, of course, show you the map, but you can find that online too. Uh, April 22nd into the 23rd is a peak of the Lyriad meteor shower. And on May 5th and 6th is the Ada Aquariad meteor shower. Now, what does Lyriad and Ada Aquariad mean? Those are the points, so-called the radiant, where the meteors tend to come from. And those are probably one of Dennis's favorite topics because from those meteors you can get meteorites. So those meteor showers uh, will be, uh, they're, they're uh, pretty major showers to witness. So they're within 10 days of each other. So if you have a moment to go outside, hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer where you can look in that general direction. And in the coming looking up, so let's put a little commercial in, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll give you a tour of that in April. Uh, so you can uh, know exactly where to look. And on Sunday, May 15th into Monday, May 16th, we have a total lunar eclipse during the flower moon. That's why flower is there. My, looks like my word moon disappeared on me. Uh, it begins at 9.32 p.m. And the so-called blood moon or the red phase begins at 11.29 p.m. So if you can stay up on a Sunday night, it's well worth it. Uh, and it ends at 12.53 Monday morning. And then the partial eclipse continues for another 90 minutes beyond that. Okay, so that's the calendar. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at another program. Ernie was mentioning all sorts of apps and things you can download. This is one that we use and it is called Stellarium. And Stellarium is a free application, kind of uh, resembles a planetarium and you can drag things around and move them. And I just set this to tomorrow just to show you down here, you'll see the date and the time. And of course, 18 is military time for six and it's 6.17 p.m. When the sun set today, it is not going to set tomorrow. 
And so what we're looking at here is we're going to go ahead and move this forward and you can uh, watch the sun set with me here. And let's roll that sun away from us. And Tim, it, and, yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but um, not seeing uh, Stellarium. I'm seeing the calendar. Oh, okay. Well, let's fix that. I'm going to stop and restart. Make sure that that comes up. Do you see it now? Yes, seeing okay. Stellarium. Okay, thank you. So you missed the beautiful sunset, uh, but the time is still here. I've got a set for uh, tomorrow at, uh, at 9.45. And what I wanna draw your attention to are some of the stars that Ernie mentioned earlier in his presentation. He said, to make sure you look at some of the brighter stars just to get started. And there is most, a good number of his list are right here in this image. I'm gonna center that a little bit because what we're looking at, we're looking at various constellations and star patterns. Now let me turn on a couple of features in Stellarium, the constellations, and I'm gonna turn on their names. This will shorten things up a little bit. But here is the constellation of Orion. And Orion is a keystone constellation for winter. But look down here in the directions, you see that it's in the west southwest. So even though Orion is a wintertime constellation, we're beginning to lose it and it is beginning to set. And some of those stars that Ernie had mentioned are right here. Here is Rigel over here in the lower corner by Orion's foot. Here's Betelgeuse up here, which, believe it or not, does translate to armpit in its native language. Isn't that just great? I'm sure you, you're just going to remember that and that alone from tonight. Um, over here, a little further to the west, there is Aldebaran. It is the evil red eye of Taurus the Bull. And on Taurus's back, we still have the Pleiades here, the Seven Sisters. So some things to look at in that direction. Now here's Orion's famous belt right here. And Orion's belt in one direction does point indeed toward Aldebaran. And in the other direction, it points toward this star here called Sirius. I am not kidding, it really is called Sirius. And Sirius is another star that's on Ernie's list, also known as the dog star. Sirius is the brightest star in the Northern hemisphere and is the brightest star and Canis Major, the big dog, and that is why it is called the Dog Star. So there's a few things to look at at sunset. And if we swing around, we try to do this slowly so that I don't make anyone over dizzy. I want you to notice that rising over here in the east is somebody very special when Orion goes away. Virgo the Lady rises and Virgo welcomes spring to you. And as you see, she is just climbing over the horizon, getting ready for spring and summer. And it's not on Ernie's list, but there is a bright star in Virgo. If we go a little further and I can advance this one hour at a time and you will notice, well, I guess you won't, you won't notice, but the star Spica is right down here. So we do have all sorts of bright stars. And look, here's Arcturus right here as well. So you can even see Arcturus. That is on Ernie's list for that he gave you earlier. And Arcturus belongs to the constellation of Buotes, the herdsman. So that's a very quick look. We have no planets in the evening sky at this point, except uh, if you want to stay up and try to find Uranus, you're more than welcome to do that. You will need a telescope. Um, but uh, most of them now, Earth has gotten to the point where Saturn and Jupiter are in the glare of the sun, so we don't have them. Um, but Venus is in the morning. Um, we, do our, we are getting Mercury back pretty soon. Mercury is another hard one to spot because it's so small and it's very dim. But if you have some landmarks, you, you will be able to spot it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward to that last calendar entry I gave you, and that is May 15th. So I'm going to change the date, and I'm going to turn off the constellations and their names. And I'm going to go back to 920 here, 
on the calendar. I actually ended up in June. I don't know how I did that, but let's go to 920. And you will see the moon rising over here in the east southeast. So this is the night of the lunar eclipse. Now we'll do more on this. And there's that star Spica again that's in Virgo. And so there's a landmark for you. That's what we mean by landmarks. Don't be fine things because the moon will be near it at that point. But as we progress through the hours of May 15th, we begin to notice something strange about the moon. At 1020, there's the moon. But look what happens by 1120. You'll notice that the moonlight almost looks like it has gone into a crescent phase, but it hasn't. It is sliding behind Earth's shadow. And Earth has a much larger shadow to cast on the moon than the moon does on the Earth. And in just a few minutes of time, you'll notice that the last of the moonlight is gone and the blood red begins. And you can see that blood red moon. And if we just let this go, we can continue to watch. And that is the moment that the moon is directly behind the earth. And the reason it turns red is because the sunlight is scattering through earth's atmosphere and only the red part of the spectrum and the part of the orange is able to diffract right back onto the moon's surface. And if you look at it, it's almost as if it's the same color as a sunrise or a sunset. And in fact, that's exactly what it is. You are looking at the combined effects of every sunrise and sunset on Earth at the same time. And you can directly view it back onto the moon. And the only time to do that is during the lunar eclipse. And as we exit the lunar eclipse, you will notice that the red disappears and the moon begins to reemerge. And by the time the eclipse ends around 2 a.m., the show is all over. So if we have a clear night that night, and hopefully it's warm, just simply go outside your house and look toward the south. You don't want to stick around for the partial eclipse. The good part is at 1130. You can do that if you want. But most of us here will probably be there the whole thing, start to finish, until 2 a.m. If I know some of these people the way I do, <laughs> we will be, if we're not together, we'll be together this way. So something to look forward to, and uh, hopefully that'll give you something to look at in the next two months. But we'll be back with another one. We'll zero in on it a little bit more next month. Um, but that is about it. So um, if there are any questions, let me know. Holly, I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you and have a great night, everybody. And don't forget those clocks. All right. Thank you, Tim. Um, so uh, we are open for business as far as questions go. We've had uh, quite a lot of engaging uh, presentations today during our looking up presentation itself. And of course, the skies outside are a little bit gloomy. We probably will not be able to offer any live views today, but we are all here looking at our live feeds on Facebook and on YouTube. If you have a question or just something to share about astronomy, feel free to drop a comment in the chat and uh, we'll share it because we've got a couple of different streams going on today and there's a lot of exciting stuff out there. In fact, Rosemary shared a really interesting bit of news just now in our Facebook chat. There's a website called Earth Sky. They reported that a Hungarian astronomer actually discovered a 10 meter wide uh, asteroid named 2022 EB5. Um, and it entered Earth's atmosphere uh, just north of Iceland, pretty far up there in the Arctic Circle on Friday. It was about one sixth the diameter of the Chelyabinsk meteorite as we saw in uh, Dennis's presentation itself. So it was small enough to disintegrate as it hit the atmosphere. Luckily, our uh, kind of level of, and our, our kind of blanket of air around our planet is taking one for the team, as I like to say. It helps protect us from uh, those, those kind of serious physical impacts that we could get. So really interesting bit of news. And uh, often we do have kind of uh, pieces of space, whether it's asteroids or, um, 
occultations or kind of blocking out or co covering of stars, we often get uh, amateur astronomers discovering those. So um, we also had another question, uh, Tim, if you want, during uh, your presentation, we got a question from Don asking, what is the name of that rabbit constellation? We saw a rabbit in the sky. Can you tell us anything about it? Oh, that is, that is great timing. Um, yeah, wow. I guess fo all focus is on uh, Lepus this time. Um, boy, talk about uh, talk about things on a hair's breadth. Wow. Um, anyway, yeah, I can show you Lepus. Let me share this back out again. Share the screen back out and share, the screen, share and share. Now, do you see Stellarium here? Just a little confirmation to make sure it's up and running. Yes. Okay, excellent. So, uh, yeah, so the rabbit that you saw is Lepus, and Lepus exists right underneath Orion. So that's where you will find this uh, discovery right here in this constellation. Um, it is not a very particularly bright constellation. It's these four stars here and these four up here mainly. Um, but a lot of kids like this constellation this time of year because it happens to be heading down below the horizon just before bedtime on Easter. Could Lepus be that elusive Easter bunny? Hmm, I wonder. So that is what the rabbit constellation is that's underneath Orion's feet. Well, actually, he's kind of in front of Orion. He's not directly under Orion's feet. Uh, that would not be good. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, it, it's not easy to see. But if you if you just just think about it for a minute and you take a leap of faith, you will find it. Back to you, Holly. Well. You know, unfortunately, we don't want Lepus to get stomped on by uh, Orion over there. However, he's always taking a very triumphant pose. It is kind of funny to me to imagine him wearing bunny slippers around wherever he may live. So um, thank you very much for uh, jumping in there again and answering our question, Tim. So we are actually going to bounce some of our messaging back over to Mike Humphrey. He has um, a little bit more to say about upcoming Buffalo Astronomical Association public events. Go away. Go ahead, <laughs> Mike. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. You can hop right over to me after coming from Dennis. I always like it when, not Dennis, but from Tim, because he always has a little bit of puns going on. Um, I just wanted to talk just a little bit because we do get a couple questions on public nights. Like, what happens on a public night? Why should I go? Is it any fun or anything like that? And just to answer that question, yes, public nights are a lot of fun. We do a lot of different kinds of things. We invite you to come out. And as members, we get to use the observatory all the time. And we go out there, we use it, we look at things, we take pictures, but it's not open to the public all the time. On um, public night, then we open it up. So you can come out, you can try out the equipment. We have a 20 inch reflector, which is one of the largest ones in Western New York. We have a lot of members who bring out their equipment. We have our C14 uh, that's in the observatory. So we roll the roof back and you can take a look at that. But what's really, really, really fun about this whole thing is everybody gets a chance to try out different things. If you have binoculars, bring them out. If you have your own telescope, bring that out. If you don't have a telescope and you don't have binoculars, come on out anyway. There's always somebody out there with some equipment if you wanna look through a telescope. Our experts, and I say experts because we all just love what we do, will give you a chance to look through and take a look at some of the things to try out some equipment, see a lot of different things. We do sky tours, of, a lot of us do a little research and we try and figure out what's up in the sky, what planets are up there, and even if there's any events. They've been out there several times and we've seen the space shuttle fly by. And right now we see the International Space Station when that goes by. And we'll show all those things to you. So whatever's out there, it's just a great time. It's a great moment to be out there with a lot of people. And you might learn a couple of things too, as long as having fun. So we like people to come out. And that's on the second. And then we have our general meeting, which is coming up. And that's on the, the following Friday. 
Now, the general meetings are pretty much for the members. So it's one benefit that we have that we like a lot of people. You can sign up. We typically have a lot of very good speakers. Um, the speaker we had last, actually yesterday, was from the vice president of the Astronomical League. So these are the type of people that we bring in to see information. We can people from NASA, people from RIT, just all over the place who have an interest in astronomy and get a chance to talk to you. But what's really great is we're doing a lot of these things live. So when Dennis shows you a rock, I'm gonna say it's a rock because I know Dennis is gonna correct me, but when he shows you a meteorite, you get a chance to sit there and do something you can't even do at a museum, which is to actually touch a meteorite. So you wanna to touch the moon, talk to Dennis. You wanna see something else, Ernie's there. And as a matter of fact, what's really great, and I'm gonna embarrass somebody right now, but the man behind the, the man in the box is Gene. You get the chance to see Gene live and in person. So they're seeing all of us being able to just walk up and see what we're doing. And it's a great time. So public night, make sure you get out there. If you wanna see a lot of different kinds of things, we just have a blast. And it's all about astronomy. It's all about learning and enjoying ourselves. If you have questions, ask your questions. If you see different things, just ask away. And it's enjoyable. So. Um, we have a couple other things. If you want to know what else we're up to, please go to our website. Now, we do have an events page where you can take a look and see where we're going to be next. I know that on the 27th, we would, and if it's still available, we would be at the uh, Wentworth Planetarium and we'll be doing a presentation there. And then we'll have some things coming up in April. So please come on out, take a look, see what we're doing. And I'm gonna throw it back to Holly because I can just keep talking like this because I get really excited because we haven't been able to do a lot of live stuff in a while. And it's exciting to know that we're gonna open up and start bringing people back in. So I'm really excited about it as you can tell. So before I keep talking, I'm gonna throw it back to Holly. Thank you, Mike. I, I really love uh, watching all of you, even behind the scenes here on our Zoom call um, and watching everybody kind of light up based on what somebody says or when you really start to get rolling about something that you love. So it is very exciting to be bringing back uh, public nights with the BAA. So yes, to reiterate, our first one will be Saturday evening, April 2nd. So we are less than a month out. If you are anywhere in the Western New York area, if you wanna make the drive down to Beaver Meadow Observatory, I'm planning on doing so as well. So you can come and meet those of us behind the screen, the people in the box, uh, the people who have trouble with their PowerPoint presentations. That's me. And uh, you can actually hear Dennis uh, kind of make the distinction between rocks and space rocks. <laughs> in fact, um, I think Dennis was uh, chuckling a little, bit behind the, a little bit behind the scenes when we mentioned rocks. I'm gonna pass it on over to him so it looks like he's got something to say. Go ahead, Dennis. Oh, I always have something to say, Holly. Thank you so much. I gotta say uh, thank you um, to Rosemary because I've got my hat and I'm headed off to Greenland. You know, it's headed to disintegrated. You know, I was just gonna hop on down the trail. You know, aha, sorry. <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible jokes. Um, but, you know, I was going to, to uh, talk to people again about uh, a number of things like, um, donations and such and meeting us. Um, so uh, given that it's our first uh, public night back on April 2nd, um, I am going to give away, yes, you heard me give away a meteorite, an actual meteorite to one lucky person at that event, if you happen to be there. Um, but in turn, um, since we are going to be springing forward and we're losing some time, and I know this is a number of people lot watching live, but there are also people who are going to watch this um, as a recorded event, either both on YouTube or Facebook. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a matching donation for you. So if you make a $10 or more donation to the Buffalo Astronomical Association, you go to our, our website, and you click on the donate link, bottom right-hand corner. Um, if you make a $10 or more donation to the Buffalo Astronomical Association from now until midnight tomorrow, so that's midnight tomorrow, so it is one less hour, I understand, but if you make it between now and midnight tomorrow, 
what I'd like you to do is send an email to membership at buffaloastronomy.com with your transaction identification that you'll get from PayPal. You heard me right. Membership at buffaloastronomy.com um, at, uh, at, and give me your transaction ID from the PayPal donation, and I will send you a meteorite. I'll need an address to send it to, but you do that in the email with your transaction ID between now and midnight tomorrow night, okay? You heard me again. I'm going to send you a meteorite for a $10 or more donation to the Buffalo Astronomical Association. So I figured I'd celebrate that because I do have a number of meteorites in my personal collection. I did send one off to Holly and I would be glad to send one off to you for a donation to the BAA or if you happen to be the lucky person who shows up uh, at the... Uh, on our live event on April 2nd. Now, I do have Teljabinsk here. This is a neodymium magnet, okay? So most regular magnets won't do it. This is a very strong magnet. You can actually see that this particular one right here is a piece of the Chelyabinsk meteorite. So yes, they're out, they're available, they're fun to collect. And I really enjoy looking up with everybody. So. Back to you, Holly, and thank you everybody for supporting us. Wow, thank you so much for your generosity, Dennis. Um, I was very, very excited to get my meteorite in the mail. It was kind of something I've been waiting next to the uh, mailbox for, and I live in a basement of an apartment building, so I had to stand outside, just kind of hang out there in the winter. It was worth it to have a little piece of space history, a little piece of something that is older than you and me, even my laptop, even my great grandma. Very exciting to, uh, to get a gift like that. Um, all for just a, uh, a small donation to the Buffalo Astronomical Association. So uh, I am going to go ahead and thank those of us who have been watching tonight, commenting tonight. Uh, shout outs again to Don, to Rosemary, to Katrina, to uh, Mike Anzalone. We have several members who uh, are, are frequent viewers of us and frequent supporters of us. And it feels very, very nice to be supported in that way. Um, and because we do not have any other uh, live views going on, I will open it up for uh, all of us to say good evening. And uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap up our program. Uh, I want to personally thank you all for watching and spending your Saturday evening with us. And uh, I would love to wish you all a safe weekend and a happy springing forward. Please continue looking up. Good night, everybody. <laughs>